Welcome to Albuquerque Housing Authority Update. I'm your host, Brian Egan. With me today, I have a special guest, Dan Foster. Hi, Hi Dan. Brian. So, Dan, where do you work? I work at Albuquerque Housing Authority. I'm the Capital Fund Projects Manager. So, basically, all of our, our bigger capital improvement initiatives, I manage those. And today we'll be talking about Rental Assistance Demonstration Program, RAD, mm -hmm. the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, mm -hmm. as well as Housing Choice Vouchers for Section 8 Rental Assistance, Public Housing Program, and the, and the Energy Performance Contract, EPC, plus how we're working to affirmatively further fair housing opportunities. That's right. So to start with, what is RAD, Rental Assistance Demonstration Program? The Rental Assistance Demonstration Program is a pathway f that allows public housing units to um, gain access to other capital. So typically, um, public housing units are not, and, and any public housing complex mm -hmm. is not allowed to carry debt or have a lien filed on the property as, say, your, your own home would. If it was private property, you could take out a home equity loan, and you, like, say you own it free and clear, and you want to get a new roof, well, you just borrow a little money, and then you pay it back over time. But government-owned public housing is different, right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. And the new unique thing is, is with public housing is, is there can be no debt on the property. So that impairs your ability to access other capital. You know, you can't go out and refinance your property or take out a new loan to do improvements. So we're stuck with very limited funds that are allocated federally. And you know, the, the trend over the, the past 10 years, at least, has been declining the amount of funds available. It's, so. It only meets about 20% of our need right now, the, the, the traditional public housing capital fund, right? I, if, if that, yeah. So we have 953 units of public housing. Um, the newest one was built and finished in 1984. Um, most of those units were built in the, in the early to mid-70s. They've, they've been maintained fairly well, but they're aging. So there's, and there hasn't been any new funds available to, to address the needs of those properties. But the good news is we're coming up with creative solutions to provide affordable housing opportunities in our town, right? That's it. And the rental, rental assistance demonstration would be one of those programs. Now, right now, that program, it was, it's a demonstration program, so it, it, and it's capped in the number of units that Congress authorized to convert out of the public housing through this rental assistance demonstration program. So right now, all of those units are allocated out to housing authorities across the country. And... And, the, and there's a wait list. And so what we've done is we've, we've submitted our first, it's just a letter of intent um, that we submit to HUD, and that puts us on the wait list. And should, some, should Congress authorize additional units to be converted, then they will ask us to submit a full application, and we'll move forward trying to actually get some of our uh, projects funded. So AHA is taking the actions it can right now. We've, we've got in line this year. We've, we're in line for RAD. As soon as the feds are willing to let us do it, we'll, we're happy to go forward and make improvements like energy efficiency and that sort of thing, right? Right. And all these, all these programs, whether it's rental assistance demonstration program, which we're, we're discussing right now, the low-income housing tax credit program, which we will discuss in a little bit, the energy performance contract program, which we'll discuss in a little bit, all of these programs have ways that you can make them overlap and work together. Well, and that leads us to a good point. So once uh, AHA is participating in rental assistance demonstration program and say we were working at 415 Fruit Avenue Northeast, what would we, uh, would we work to get tax credits as well to help pay for things? Yeah, so the rental assistance demonstration program itself does not come with any funding. And that's, that's where it gets broad bipartisan support because it doesn't cost any, any money in the authorization. Um, what it allows us to do is also apply to the New Mexico Mortgage Finance Authority for an allocation of low-income housing tax credits. That would bring in, you know, that can pay for up to 75% of the redevelopment costs of, of the renovation of a property. And then it also would allow us to go out and uh, pursue private funds from a Bank of America or, you know, any other lender, and we could borrow 
money and, and have a mortgage on the property and, and use all those things to really do some substantial renovations at our properties. Like you were saying, we could get a home equity loan. It's somewhat like that. Once you become a rental assistance demonstration program, then you can get a, uh, put a lien on the property and that's where you get the remaining 25% funding to match the 75% in, uh, funding you got from the tax credits and you have enough money to do the whole project. Correct. And uh, Mortgage Finance Authority, MFA, their offices are here in Albuquerque and, and we've won money from them before, right? Yeah, we had the uh, Rio Vista Apartments project that we got funded a couple of years ago and we're um, about three quarters of the way done with that project and that was a 75-unit um, senior housing project. It was not a public housing um, property. It does have, uh, it is a restrict income restricted property and it's also restricted to seniors. So, and it has a rental assistance contract tied to it so that no tenants pay more than 30% of their rent. So it's a, it's a tremendous asset for the community. And so Rio Vista Apartments is located at 770 Wantabo, 770 Wantabo Boulevard Northeast. And that's our first sort of um, that's the first time we've used tax credits uh, to do something so we can demonstrate that we're good at it and these are competitive funds so you have to demonstrate Correct. every time you apply that you deserve more money. Mm -hmm. And we partnered with, with a, a very strong developer on that one, Wishrock Investments Groups. Um, their development division is based out of Missoula, Montana and that's where most of the staff that we're working with are, are based and then they also have offices in Portland, Maine. But, this is this is that's their kind of specialty is is using low income housing tax credits to renovate properties that have a rental assistance contract on them. And so at Rio Vista Apartments, the AHA was able to achieve the goal of preserving its affordability for another generation. All the tenants that are there presently, all 75 households get to stay long term. They're go the building will outlive them because this is stretching out another 40 years and it'll be available for the next generation of elderly tenants that need it. Yeah, and and we've done some some tremendous um, improvements at that property. Like what? Well, well we've done, one is, is a completely new heating cooling system, a high-tech new system, um, new roofs, more insulation. Uh, we're going to meet um, the enterprise green communities, green building criteria. So it's, a, it's a, going to be a very energy efficient, water efficient property. And, and the, I think more to the point for the residents that live there, it's a much improved property. You know, they got new, completely new kitchens, um, new cupboards, new, you know, all, all new um, appliances, and, and just renovated units. Um, we had added balconies to the first floor units. The upper floor units always had balconies, but the first floor never had a patio, so we added cement patios. With a with a nice little fence, decorative fence around it, and so, doing a bunch of landscaping, and it's so it's going to be an asset to those people that live there. Their living conditions are going to be much improved, and then also we're doing a lot of things for curb appeal. Um, it wasn't it wasn't a, a particularly bad property to begin with. It had been very well maintained, had decent landscaping, but we're we're doing a lot of things that are going to increase the curb appeal, painting new stucco on the exterior, um, relay, redoing some of the parking lot for circulation issues, and, um, and then just a lot of landscaping, and so some extra tenant amenities, exteriors, so a little gazebos and walkways, things like that. And so it's going to be a much more attractive property for the community. And it'll be water-wise landscaping. We're going to zero escaping, so the water bill is going to go down. The gas and electric bills are going down because it's an energy-efficient building now. And if you reduce the utility costs, you can ex uh, makes the building more economical to operate. It mm -hmm. allows the tenants to be able to afford to live there because their utility bills are smaller and their rent, the rents can stay the same. And uh, it's also creating jobs in the community, right? It is. It is. I, I don't know what the number is off the top of my head. I'm guessing it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 200, 200 jobs. And it's enhanced the neighborhood around it as well now that they have this uh, beautiful renovated building there. They got new windows. Yeah, and I'd like, you know, we really need to give thanks to um, the, the county commissioners. This was the first low-income housing project that was allocated um, industrial revenue bonds. So, and that, that's based on the, the commercial impact it's going to have because of the curb appeal and because of the attractiveness of that property and its location next to a lot of businesses. And so, and so the revenue bond allows the, the property to remain off of the property tax roll, so they, uh, the complex won't have to pay property taxes. That's correct, and that's, that's the, the, the big benefit is 
it, it operate it came in somewhere up to about thirty five or forty thousand dollars a year we're saving on on taxes and what that allowed us to do is is a big portion of that allowed us to finance a larger mortgage. We're going to be able to pay back more. So when you translate that into actual dollars for capital building, you know we we had it was seven or eight hundred thousand more we were able to borrow based on that that uh, tax savings over a fifteen year period. So that's an example of how Albuquerque Housing Authority is getting creative, partnering with the county, partnering with the city, partnering with the U.S. Department of Housing and Redevelopment HUD to find money wherever we can to provide affordable housing and self-sufficiency opportunities. We're always looking for those opportunities to, to leverage and come up with new innovative ways to address the housing needs in the city. So, so Albuquerque Housing Authority owns, operates, and manages about 953 public housing units. And that's then we correct. Have a, and then another big rental assistance program we have is Section 8 housing choice vouchers, and that the housing choice vouchers are for privately owned houses and apartments where we give the tenant a voucher and say, it's your choice. Please go find a house or apartment to rent, right? Yeah, that's, that's correct. And so that's, it's, a, it's um, a portable voucher, and it travels with that, that client, that resident, versus a project-based um, rental assistance contract, which would remain with a property. And, so, and for housing choice voucher holders, um, they're free to go wherever they want, but um, the landlord there doesn't have to necessarily provide a wheelchair ramp if you're a tenant in a wheelchair. So public housing is great because the landlord will provide ramps. We're, we're working to make improvements, right? Yeah, right now we're in the process of converting 5% of our total units um, to comply with Americans with Disabilities Act and the Uniform Federal Accessibility Standards. So there are two... Um, similar but slightly different standards. The Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA. The ADA covers um, all of the common area work and all of the work that is done outside of a unit. So access to the playgrounds, making sure they're accessible, parking spaces, mailboxes, um, any, any amenities. Our, our, the office that we work at, the administrative office on University our, Boulevard? Our administrative offices, we're, we're kicking off a renovation of our, our own offices. Um, the brunt of that remodel is focused on compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So our, our building isn't too bad because we were, we were built in the late 90s. So, but it still doesn't meet current standards. The current standards. So we're bringing up to the current standards. A lot of that stuff is, is making sure that there's clear passages, correct door swings, mm -hmm. um, so that somebody with a mobility impairment can, can get around. For example, one of our department directors is a, a person in a wheelchair, and we want to make sure that our own staff can get into every room in the building. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot about tenants. It's a lot about, you know, making, making sure our clients can access our staff and access our resources. But it is. It also is for our staff as well. Like, you know, we have, we have a number of, of staff that have mobility impairments. And, We'll be improving the bathrooms to make sure people can get in and out of the bathroom safely. We'll make sure the kitchen in the building is better. Right, and then we're also kind of in combination with that. We're doing some, some other safety upgrades to make sure that, that doors uh, swing shut in the event of an emergency or a fire. So we can, they, they, they have what's called mag locks, so you push it open and magnetically is held open. But then in an event of an emergency, that magnet is tripped, it releases, the door, the door is swing shut. And, and these are common features in modern buildings all across America. Yeah, it's, 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 now, it's now pretty much code for, for a building. And then for the residences, the, uh, the units were uh, going to be doing similar things, right? With the uh, UFIS, Uniform Federal Accessibility Standards? Correct. So we're, we're doing work you know, that will ensure that there's accessible pathways that run from parking areas to designated designated units and then to other site amenities if there's a playground, if there the trash cans, the um, mailboxes, things like that. And then inside the units we're making sure that we have door clearances, that there's turning radiuses in bathrooms and in kitchens. So it's a lot the brunt of of our unit work is focused around making sure that there is turning radiuses and clear spaces mm -hmm. in the kitchens and in the bathrooms. And that we have, ro we're doing a lot of roll-in showers, handheld shower heads. And will all the wheelchair accessible apartments be at one building at one site, or is it going to be all over the place? No, we're we're scattering. I mean, the the idea is is we want to make sure that we have these located throughout the city, so that somebody 
um, with a disability isn't quarantined to one one part of the city. Um, you want so to deconcentrate. We're deconcentrating. Yep, just like you know, we're making sure that there's opportunities throughout the city for anybody with a disability, and um, so. Just as a practical measure, we, we're not trying to convert every site we have because most of these um, units were built before Americans with Disabilities Act was ineffective or, or the Uniform Federal Accessibility Standards were in effect. Right, because our, our units were built mainly in the 70s and the 80s, and the ADA didn't come about until 1990. So if we've got a so two-story town home, you, you, that won't work. A two-story home won't work. There are also site conditions, so if, if the the housing complex was on a hill there's just practically no way to to achieve the the ramp slopes that we would need to achieve to make a you know uh, have access to a particular unit or a portion of that site uh, you know we can't we can't lower the buildings and right. you can't really raise all the parking areas because we have a limited amount of funding like you said before we have to be very frugal right right we're, we're so we've kind of tried to be um, Selective, making sure while we we're making sure that we get good geographic distribution for opportunity, that that we are picking the the units and the sites that are most easily con converted. So we're trying to be responsible stewards of public funds. And then, so by the end of 2017, uh, we hope to start on New Year's Day 2018 with five percent of our public housing units being converted. Right. Yep, that's a, at a minimum. Mm -hmm. And we're also thinking about people who have visual impairments and auditory impairments, so we may have places where the, the doorbell flashes instead of rings if you yeah, can't hear anymore. That's correct. So 5% of our units are going to be converted um, for the, to, to be in full compliance with Uniform Federal Accessibility Standards, Americans with Disabilities Act, and that's you know targeting a lot of people with mobility impairments. The, the other, we also have 2% for people with hearing and visual impairments. So, and that's in addition to the 5%. So there'll be other ones that have um, flashing strobes at, for door, instead of a, a ringing doorbell, things of that nature. And like the smoke alarm would flash and strobe instead of just ring. Right. And that's very helpful in an elderly disabled building where people may be having hearing aids and they can't hear as well. They wake up in the middle of the night and, and they don't have their hearing aids on. They need to see the flashing alarm telling them to get out. Right. There's multiple cues, so not dependent on one, one sense that might be impaired. Mm -hmm. And then speaking of um, persons with disabilities, Albuquerque Housing Authority is for everybody, right? We, uh, we follow the Federal Fair Housing Act. We like to provide, a f um, um, we don't discriminate on the basis of disability. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And in fact, Albuquerque Housing Authority is in partnership right now with the city of Rio Rancho and the city of Albuquerque to do more in that area, right? Yeah, we were involved in a project uh, that's affirmatively furthering fair housing. And so we're, we're currently taking public comments on our draft version of the assessment of fair housing opportunities in the Albuquerque area, right? That's correct. And we'll be taking um, public comment all the way through Friday, September 29th, 2017, um, um, when we're going to have, um, a, we'll also have a public um, meeting on September 20th, 2017, and people can submit comments to the Housing Authority in writing. Our office address is 1840 University Boulevard Southeast, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, or they can come to one of our meetings, and our Board of Housing Commissioners will have a public meeting on Wednesday, October 18th, 2017, at the Albuquerque Housing Authority office at 1840 University Boulevard Southeast, where they'll vote in public on uh, adopting this assessment of fair housing opportunities. That's right, yeah, and every, every one of our board meetings is open to the public, so. Because we follow the Open Meetings Act, just like the City Council. That's correct. And, and the Federal Fair Housing Act protects people on the basis of race, color, creed, religion, national origin, disability, or familial status, right? Yeah, that's correct. Those are what are called the protected classes. So uh, as, a, as a good landlord, we would never tell someone, oh, well, we don't rent to children. You know, uh, you have to be 18 or over to live in this apartment complex. Yeah, that's right. We, we're, we're strictly prohibited from doing that. Um, in fact, any private landlord is, in theory, restricted from, prohibited from mm -hmm. doing that as well. But, but we do have a special exception from HUD that we could have an elderly building. So we're like... Right. You can, you can have, you can have um, projects that... that target a specific audience as long as that is a federally recognized program. And we have to check. You know, we make sure all the people that live in the building are over age 55 or 62 or whatever the rule is for that particular place. Correct. 
And then, um, and also we're, we're, um, we have a pet policy that says you can have one dog or one cat, but of course if you need a therapy animal for disability reasons, that's different. Yes. And all landlords should be that way, right? Should be. And then um, also, um, Albuquerque Housing Authority is working to develop more housing, correct? Yeah, we're always, we're always looking to try to find other opportunities to develop more housing. Um, do we have a, a long-term plan to do this? We do. We have our, it's, it's our housing plan, and it's our 10-year plan to address housing needs. Now, the, the initial core of it is focused on rehabilitating the existing units we have, because we have these 953 units that are all aging. Because first you have to preserve what you have before you add. Correct, and we already have families living in them. We want, it, we want their quality of life to be good and the quality of housing they have to be you know, at the best we can, we can, we can provide for them. And, and that's why we've replaced the roofs recently, and, and now we're making them more units wheelchair accessible, and then how does the energy performance contract tie into that? The energy performance contract, it's another HUD funding program. It's one of the other, the few other ways we can have a form of debt on public housing. Now, in this case, um, what we're financing with the energy performance contract are, are different um, energy conservation measures, ECMs is what they're called in, in the EPC lingo. So, but that's what we're doing across the board is low flow, low flow aerators in the kitchen, bathroom sinks. To save water. To save water, yep. And that's a huge savings, low flow shower heads. And we did test those. So, you know, they've, they've been tested and approved by those are do, that are actually doing the install. So they're actually, they're actually quite nice. So they have good, you, have good, you have good pressure, you're just not wasting any yeah, water. Yeah, we're not, we're not reenacting the Seinfeld episode where, we had to, <laughs> where the tenants had to smuggle in new shower, high flow shower heads from, from the... <laughs> so they could actually rinse all the soap off, yeah. Yeah, you can actually get the soap off with these shower heads. They're, they're, they're pretty nice. So we're doing that, and then we're replacing all the interior lighting, the, uh, the standard incandescent light bulbs with um, energy-efficient LED lighting. They're both energy-efficient, and they last longer. So there'll be less maintenance to do. Less maintenance. We're doing um, exterior lighting at a number of units, not all of them, but we're at a number of properties. We're redoing exterior lighting to replace the um, old exterior lights with energy efficient LED exterior lighting. So it'll be brighter parking lots that use less electricity. That's right. Yeah, trying, trying to hit, um, in addition to just hitting the energy conservation um, issues, we're trying to also address capital needs and safety needs at the same time we're doing that. So, and then um, a number of units were also replacing furnaces with higher efficiency furnaces, hot water heaters with higher efficiency hot water heaters. We're doing things like in some of our uh, senior housing properties that have electric um, stovetops, we're replacing the, the burners with what are called safety burners. Mm -hmm. So they're burners that only get so hot and, and then they, they don't get any hotter and then they also shut off after a certain period of time. So well, you don't have to worry about grandma leaving, uh, leaving the tea kettle on all night. Right, and it's burning down the house, or at least setting off the fire alarm, mm -hmm. making the whole complex smell of burnt beans. Yeah, and having mm -hmm. to everyone evacuate at 2 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Those are the issues we're trying to, and it also saves energy. So that one's a double hit. It creates a safer living environment, and it's more energy conserva conservation. And so, um, so we're, first we're preserving what we have, and the next we plan to expand over the next decade. How do we uh, plan to expand? Well, primarily what we would be doing is, is looking for opportunities. We'll be looking for opportunities to partner with the city to acquire land um, and, and looking for other housing partners to work with, but basically building new units. Mm -hmm. That's how we expand our housing. Building, and then we'll also watch for opportunities to acquire properties. And so we're presently looking at our, our whole public housing portfolio and figuring some, some of these units we should replace and maybe build a larger building there instead of a one-story building. Yeah, some of our sites we just don't have as much uh, density as we would like. They, would, they were built at a time where the land wasn't, was, was more freely available and they didn't make the best use of the space on a given site. And then when you combine that with some housing that's, that's aging, um, 
some of the, the better opportunity instead of trying to redevelop those particular housing units, uh, we're looking at probably demoing them and replacing them then with, with a higher density multifamily apartment buildings. And all of our current tenants will be able to remain in the program. No, one, no one's going to lose a place in the public housing program while we shift around. Correct. And typically what, we're, what we'd be required to do is, is we have to go, it's, it's not a quick process. So it's not something that's going to happen overnight. You know, typically it would be a, a, a pretty well-paced. Many years. A well-paced well development would be a three-year cycle from the time we say, okay, we're going we're gonna to submit an application to HUD till the time HUD approves us. Dis because it would involve actually the public housing units being disposed of by the housing authority. And then we'd, we'd be in a new legal structure. It would still be the housing authority, but it would be under a different legal entity. And that has to do with how the funding works. It'd still be but affordable to the tenants. It would still be affordable. Yeah. From, the, from the tenant perspective, they, what they would be getting is a new home. All the rental assistance they receive would still be in place. Their rents wouldn't change. What they would get would be new apartments. And um, what we're, but part of that application process involves consultation with, with tenants, with residents. And typically what we would have to do is, is we would have to replace the housing units that were demolished. One for one, typically. One, one for one, yep. And our goal is not to do one for one. Our, our goal is more like to do three for one. You know, they might not be the same type of units. For example, um, our highest demand right now is for two and three bedroom units. So we would probably be targeting more of those instead of, you know, say we have four bedroom units on a property. Yeah, we don't need to build any more five bedroom houses right now. Not right now. That's not where the strongest demand is. Now, if we were targeting a specific property for redevelopment. We submitted our disposition application to HUD, and there were, you know, say 75% of the families in those units, you know, in their four-bedroom units, for example, and 75% of those families need four-bedroom units. We would most likely be required, and we want to, replace those four-bedroom units with four-bedroom units mm -hmm. for those ones. And then any additional units we would probably do in two or three bedrooms, just as an example. Mm -hmm. And then and AHA is always looking for affordable housing funding. So for example, we're interested in the Workforce Housing Trust Fund bond issue, and the city of Albuquerque sometimes helps us with funding, not just the federal government. That's correct, yeah. The, the city of Albuquerque has, um, I think, you know, th there's three pots of money that come to mind for me immediately. The one is the Affordable Workforce Housing Trust Fund, the bond money. Second one that they get is they get what's called home money from, and that all comes from U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. And then the third pot of money is community development block grants. The CDBG funding. Correct. And all of those fundings you know, potentially can be used for, for Albuquerque Housing Authority public housing. Like one time they gave us community development block grant funding and we replaced a few roofs and we bought some playground equipment. Our new tenant-based rental assistance program, TBRA, is funded with home funds. Mm -hmm. And so we're always, we're always looking for money. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, thank you, Dan, for being my guest today, and good luck building more houses. Thank you.